Hello. Can you explain to me what matter is? Look at all the things around us. Chairs, desks, cupboards, papers and pens in my classroom. Motor cars, bicycles and buses in the streets. Trees, plants and animals in the countryside. Birds, airplanes and clouds in the sky. Fishes, seaweeds and corals in the sea. Stars, the moon and the sun in outer space. These and all other things, including the human body are examples of matter. Matter is anything that takes up space and has weight. That is a heavy concept. What is matter made of? Since ancient times, philosophers have thought about matter and what it is made up of. One group of philosophers thought that matter was made up of a substance called Hyal. Another group of philosophers said that matter was made up of four substances. Earth, water, air, and fire. A. A third group believed that matter was made up of very tiny particles which were too small to be seen. These particles were so small that they could never be further divided into smaller particles. They gave the particles the name atoms. Which means, those which cannot be divided. The difference between the various kinds of atoms and the ways in which they were joined was supposed to result in the different kinds of matter. All these ideas arose purely from the mind, and were not based on investigation. For many years, people believed in the second idea. But actually it is the third idea that is nearer to our present concept of matter. So the ancient Greeks had some good ideas about matter. We must have some good ideas now. We do. However, it took nearly 2,000 years before we developed these ideas. Further, in the early 19th century, John Dalton, an English school teacher, stated in his atomic theory that matter was made up of tiny, indivisible particles, which he also called atoms. His laboratory work showed him that atoms could neither be divided into smaller parts, nor could they be destroyed. He pictured matter as being made up of tiny solid spherical atoms. Today this idea of atoms has been accepted. But further work has shown our contrary to Dalton's findings. Atoms are much more complex. And made up of even smaller particles. How did scientists work this out? Towards the end of the 19th century, J.J. Thomson, an English physicist, studied the behavior of an electric current passing through a tube, from which air had been removed. This tube is known as a cathode ray tube. He found that the current consisted of negatively charged particles which we now call electrons. His experiments led him to conclude that the electrons came from the inside of atoms. Other scientists were able to find out the mass of an electron. This mass was only a small fraction of that of the lightest atom. Showing an electron was even smaller than an atom. What else did they discover about atoms? Around the same time, some scientists discovered that certain atoms were capable of breaking up into smaller atoms by themselves. In the process of breaking up, they give off particles smaller than themselves. Such atoms are called radioactive atoms. One kind of particle given off by these radioactive atoms is known as an alpha particle. What did this discovery lead to? Around 1911, Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealand-born physicist sent a stream of fast-moving alpha particles towards a very thin piece of gold foil. To his surprise he found that most of the tiny alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil as though it was not there. Only a few particles were deflected or bounced back. Why do you think this happened? The reason why most of the particles passed straight through without their path being blocked was that the atoms in the gold foil were not solid, but consisted mainly of empty space. However, at the center of each atom, there was a small but heavy mass of matter against which a few other particles collided and bounced back. Rutherford called this heavy mass at the center of the atom the nucleus. It was then found that the atoms of all other substances too had nucleus. This all sounds very exciting. What does an atom look like? Scientists were able to make guesses about what atoms were like by studying their behavior. From these guesses they build models. There are many different kinds of models of an atom. And it must be kept in mind that none of these models really look like the real atom. But all of them. In one way or another help us to understand the behavior of atoms. 
By this time scientists learn that atoms contain particles called electrons. Two other kinds of particles also present in the atoms are the protons and neutrons. An electron has a negative electric charge. While a proton has a positive electric charge. But a neutron does not have any electric charge. One important property of particles which have electrical charges is that particles with opposite charges attract each other. While those with the same charges repel each other. Therefore, a positively charged particle attracts a negatively charged particle. On the other hand, positively charged particles repel one another. The same applies to negatively charged particles. In most atoms there is an equal number of electrons and protons. As a result, an atom as a whole is electrically neutral. The protons and the neutrons are closely packed in the center of an atom. Together they form the nucleus. The number of protons in the nucleus of the atom is known as the atomic number. The total number of protons and neutrons within the nucleus is known as the mass number. Once the two numbers are known we can easily find out the number of neutrons in a nucleus by using the equation. Number of neutrons equals mass number minus atomic number. The electron is the lightest of the three particles. In fact it is so light when compared with the mass of the proton or the neutron that it can be considered as having no mass. However, it has a great deal of energy and moves very fast. The atom consists mainly of empty space. As Rutherford's gold foil experiment showed, the nucleus occupies a very small portion of this space. While the electrons are distributed around the nucleus in places called shells or energy levels. It has been found that electrons form a sort of cloud around the nucleus. Because the idea is not easy to imagine. We shall follow the model put forth by Niels Bohr, a Danish scientist in 1913. This model is simpler, and therefore more useful for our present level of understanding. In this case, the electrons are pictured as moving around the nucleus in orbits, similar to the way planets move around the sun. This is all very fascinating, but if everything is made of the three basic particles, how do we get different types of matter? There are over a hundred different kinds of atoms, and the difference between each kind lies in the total number of electrons, protons, and neutrons each atom has. Each kind of atom has a name. Scientists write the names of every atom in a short form. These short forms are called symbols. All elements of one or two letters in their symbol with the first letter being a capital. Here you can see the names of some of the atoms, their symbols, the atomic numbers, the number of neutrons, the number of electrons in the mass number. This structure seems to be a bit confusing. You will notice that the hydrogen atom consists of an electron and a proton. It is the only atom that does not have a neutron. Look at the pictures of the hydrogen atom. The proton in the center is the nucleus. Moving around the nucleus is a single electron. Now, let's look at the atom of helium. Each atom has two electrons, two protons and two neutrons. The structure of the atom is shown here. The two electrons move at equal distances around the nucleus. They are said to orbit in the same shell. Again, this is just a model. It is a bit more complicated. The atom of lithium is made up of three electrons, three protons and four neutrons. As you can see, the arrangement is slightly different. The nucleus is made up of three protons and four neutrons. As with the helium atom, two electrons are orbiting in the same shell. But the third electron is willing at a greater distance from the nucleus. It is orbiting in another shell. From experiments, scientists have found that each shell can contain only a definite number of electrons. For example, there can be no more than two electrons in the first shell. That is, the one nearest the nucleus. The second shell can only contain eight electrons. When a shell contains the maximum number of electrons, it is said to be full, or complete. An important point to note is that it is the electrons present in the outermost shell that take part in most chemical reactions. We shall learn about chemical reactions later. If there are only a small number of atoms and elements, how do we get the wide range of substances around us? Matter which is made up of the same kind of atoms is known as an element. Suppose there are 118 different kinds of atoms. Then how many elements are there all together? We can also use the name of the atom for the name of the element. Thus we can say that hydrogen, carbon, iron, tin, and so on are elements. 
On the other hand, matter which is made up of two, three or even more different kinds of atoms joined together as a group is known as a compound. For example, two hydrogen atoms may combine with one oxygen atom to form a compound called dihydrogen monoxide, which is commonly known as water. Common salt is sodium chloride. A compound formed from the elements sodium and chlorine. Can you imagine how many compounds can be formed by the different combinations of the various elements? It is probably a lot. How does this happen? Now with our knowledge of the makeup of the atoms, we want to see how combination between atoms takes place. A chemical reaction is said to take place when atoms combine in different ways. We have already noted earlier that the electrons in the outermost shell of the atom play an important part in chemical reactions. This is because in most cases, it is the outermost shell of an atom that is not completely filled with electrons. When two such atoms react, the electrons in their outermost shells tend to arrange in such a way that each atom has its outermost shell completely filled. This can be done by 1. Sharing some of their outer electrons with other atoms. 2. Getting extra electrons from other atoms or 3. Donating all their outer electrons to other atoms. When they have a full outer shell, they are said to be stable. Take the case of the hydrogen atom. It has only one electron in the shell. How many electrons more are needed to complete this shell? I don't know. The answer is one. What happens if this atom comes across another hydrogen atom which also needs one more electron? It would then be natural for the two atoms to combine together by sharing their electrons so that each has a full outer shell. These two atoms are now bound together as a group by electron sharing. Such groupings of atoms are known as molecules. For example, hydrogen gas is made up of hydrogen molecules. Let us now study a more complicated case. Hydrogen and oxygen atoms. An oxygen atom has eight electrons. The electronic structure would then be two electrons around the nucleus in the first shell, and six electrons in the second shell. It needs two more electrons to complete the outer shell. From the previous example, we know that each hydrogen atom needs one electron to complete its shell. What happens then when hydrogen and oxygen atoms are brought together under certain favorable conditions? Every oxygen atom will combine readily with two hydrogen atoms so that all the three atoms have full outermost shells. Thus we have molecules of hydrogen oxide, better known as water. This electron sharing is known as a covalent bond. What about common salt? Chemically known as sodium chloride. Common salt is made up of sodium atoms and chlorine atoms. A sodium atom has 11 electrons. Two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second, and one electron in the third or outer shell. A chlorine atom has 17 electrons. Two in the first, eight in the second, and seven in the third shell. The sodium atom must do one of two things to achieve stability. To lose one electron from its third shell, or to gain seven electrons to fill the third shell. Which is easier. To lose one electron, of course. When it does so, the total number of protons in the atom will be greater than the total number of electrons. As a result, the atom as a whole is positively charged. This kind of positively charged atom is known as a positive ion. On the other hand, the easier way for the chlorine atom to achieve stability is to gain one electron rather than to lose the seven in its outermost shell. Naturally it will accept the electron readily given off by the sodium atom. This additional electron makes the atom as a whole negatively charged and the atom is now a negative ion. How do you think the positive and negative ions will behave towards each other? They will be attracted to each other because of their electrically opposite charges and will be held together by this electrical force. This is how sodium chloride is formed from sodium and chlorine. This type of bonding is called ionic bonding. The electrons seem to be doing most of the work. Does the nucleus change? Earlier we noted that the nucleus of an atom consists of protons and neutrons, very tightly packed together in the center of the atom. Protons are positively charged particles while neutrons have no electrical charges. We know that like charges repel. So, a question arises. Why are the protons not repelled by one another thereby resulting in the breaking up of the nucleus? The answer lies in the existence of another kind of force that is stronger than a repulsive force between the protons. This force is called the nuclear force. 
It is this powerful nuclear force that binds the protons so closely together. This force comes from a form of energy called the binding energy of the nucleus. How does this energy come about? According to a very important discovery by Albert Einstein, a German-born physicist, and a really clever guy, mass can be changed to energy and similarly, energy can be changed to mass. This was expressed in the formula E equals mc squared. It was found that the mass of the nucleus is slightly less than the total mass of the protons and neutrons which made up the nucleus. The difference in mass has been converted to energy to keep the protons and the nucleus together. That is a pretty heavy concept. The protons, the neutrons and the nuclei of most common atoms are strongly held together. The nuclei of these atoms are said to be stable. On the other hand the nuclei of some atoms, especially the bigger ones like uranium, are not so stable. This is partly due to the large number of protons and neutrons present in the nuclei. The nuclear force becomes weaker as the nuclei get bigger, so the protons start feeling the electrostatic repulsion more. Large unstable nuclei have a tendency to break up on their own into smaller nuclei. They can also be made to break up or split into smaller nuclei if they are bombarded with very small particles. The splitting of the nucleus of an atom is called fission. But what is the importance of fission? When fission of, say, a uranium nucleus occurs, the nucleus splits up into smaller nuclei of other atoms, giving off neutrons and a large amount of nuclear energy in the form of heat. The energy given off from the fission of just one kilogram of uranium is equivalent to the energy we can obtain from burning over 900,000 kilograms of coal. Just imagine what a tremendous amount of energy we can get from the fission of atoms. There are two different kinds of uranium. One is called uranium-238. That is, uranium of mass number 238. And the other uranium-235. That is, uranium of mass number 235. Uranium-235 is less stable than uranium-238 and is therefore commonly used to produce nuclear energy by fission. What do scientists use to split atoms? Normally they use neutrons, protons, or alpha particles. These particles are used as a kind of atomic bullet. Neutrons are good atomic bullets because they do not possess any electrical charge. This is why they can penetrate and break up the positively charged nuclei more easily than the protons or the alpha particles made up of two protons and two neutrons. On the other hand, if the positively charged protons or alpha particles are used, they will be repelled by the positively charged nucleus. However, in some experiments it is necessary to use protons and alpha particles as atomic bullets. In such cases, the particles have to move very fast before they can penetrate the nuclei. Particle accelerators are used to make the particles move very fast. The biggest particle accelerator in the world is the Large Hadron Collider in Europe. These are mounted between the poles of a very powerful electromagnet. What can happen when particles are accelerated at high speeds? We have learned that when a uranium atom is hit by a neutron, it breaks up into smaller atoms, giving off neutrons and energy. What happens when there are many uranium atoms around? The neutrons given off by the first uranium atom will strike a few more uranium atoms nearby. These neutrons will split the atoms and release more neutrons to strike even more uranium atoms. This rapid process is repeated again and again. And in a very short time millions of uranium atoms would have undergone fission. This is called a chain reaction. If a chain reaction were to take place too quickly as in the case of a lump of uranium-235, the energy given off would be so great that a huge explosion will take place. The atomic bomb works on this principle. Luckily, scientists have learned how to slow down and control the speed of fast nuclear chain reactions. The place where such a reaction can be controlled is known as a nuclear reactor. How is a nuclear chain reaction controlled? It is controlled by surrounding the fissionable material. For example, uranium-235, with a substance like graphite, a form of carbon, which is known as a moderator. This slows down the speed of the neutrons. Rods, made of neutron-absorbing material, are loaded into the nuclear reactor to act as a further control measure. Are there any other kinds of nuclear reaction? There is another way of getting energy from the nuclei of atoms. Instead of breaking down the unstable nuclei of heavy atoms, we can also get energy by joining together two light nuclei to make a heavy nucleus. 
This process is called nuclear fusion. Fusion of the nuclei of deuterium and tritium. Two forms of hydrogen, known as heavy hydrogen, results in the formation of the helium nucleus and the release of a neutron. This fusion reaction can only take place at temperatures above 30 million degrees. The explosion of a hydrogen bomb is the result of uncontrolled nuclear fusion. It is the most terrible weapon of war that man has invented. Unfortunately, scientists have not been able to find a way of controlling this nuclear fusion and put its vast source of energy to further the well-being of mankind. What are some other uses of atoms? The study of atoms have brought about many uses which are beneficial to man and some which are not. 1. Source of power. Controlled nuclear fission can provide us with tremendous amounts of energy or power to work. It was once thought that this could be our main source of power. Once the present sources of energy like coal and petroleum were exhausted. There is still much debate about its use as a power source. 2. Medical applications. Radioactive substances. Such as radium and cobalt used to treat cancer. The radiation is used to kill the cancer cells. Thus putting a stop to the growth of the cancerous tissue. 3. Carbon dating. Like uranium. Carbon has two kinds of atoms. One of them is radioactive. That is. It breaks up continuously. As time passes. The amount of radioactive carbon in an object becomes less and less. By finding the percentage of radioactive carbon remaining in an object. Scientists are able to calculate the age of an object. This method of determining age is called carbon dating. It is by carbon dating that scientists are able to find out the age of objects which archaeologists. People who study things from prehistoric period. Dig up from the ground. 4. Tracer research. Scientists are interested to know more about biochemical reactions. That is. Reactions that take place inside a living cell. By using chemicals with radioactive atoms. The path of the chemicals in the cells can be traced. The radioactive atoms used in this way are called traces and through them biochemical reactions can be studied. 5. Weapons. The atomic and hydrogen bombs are examples of how nuclear energy can be used for destructive purposes. Their power of destruction is beyond description. That is a lot of uses. The study of atoms is a fascinating subject that has yet to be exhausted. The more the scientists examine the atoms, the more mysteries are uncovered. Today, Besides the electrons, protons and neutrons, many more particles have been discovered. However, that is another story.